okay, let's start over again. Thank you very much, Alyssa. Um, okay, so I did hit record and we have someone who's going to be letting people in so that I don't try to do uh, two things, drive the show and try to let people in at the same time. So I will start over, take two. Welcome everyone. My name is Monique Sullivan and I am the Continuous School Improvement Coordinator for the main model, Maine's Model of School Supports. Uh, before we get started, if everyone could just put their name and their role in the chat, because we do use that as a way to just keep track of who's coming um, to these as a part of our support. And while you're doing that, um, as you can see, we do have an update to our uh, slide deck presentation or the format that we're now using. Hopefully you guys will like it, a little bit of a different color scheme. Um, and this slide deck, along with the meeting recording, will be available hopefully by next week. I think the turnaround time is about two or one or two days, maybe three days um, to get uploaded to YouTube. And an email notification will be sent via grants for me when everything is ready for release. And if you miss the email or it gets lost in your inbox, you can just go ahead and check in the history log in your FY24 SIG application because all the correspondence sent to schools and SAUs through Grants For Me, it's being stored in the history log. We now have a little box that we check, so you can go back there and look at your history log if for some reason you don't get that email. Also, I know that you guys have a thousand things on your plate. I know you've got a lot of things that you're working, a lot of initiatives, and it's Thursday, um, and I know some of you guys had a late start today. So uh, I'm gonna try to make this as short as I can. Um, and you might notice some uh, pagination, like why did it go from slide seven to slide 10? Um, because when I was working on the on the slide deck, I had a lot I wanted to put in there, but in the end I was like, they don't wanna hear all this. So when I send out the slide deck, you'll get the full slide deck, but for the presentation, I'm gonna I cut some things out just so that we can keep it. Um, I'm hoping like 30 minutes and then you guys will have time to give us some feedback at the end and then also um, ask any questions that you may have. Okay, to get started. So the agenda today is um, updates, the grants for grant requirements, um, which I did at the last meeting, the year at a glance, continuing on with February, um, and that what you should be doing in your leadership team meeting if you're following the year at a glance, which would be mid-year updates and celebrations. Um, any kind of, and the next meeting, it's kind of a preview of what we're gonna be doing at the next meeting in March. Um, and, and then the opportunity to give us some feedback. And then uh, again, we'll have resources, contact information and opportunity for you to ask us any questions that you have. And I say us, but it's really just me at this point. So um, I'll try to use I instead of we. Okay, so updates. The ESSA dashboard went live on January 29th with the FY22-23 data. So hopefully you've had an opportunity to look at that data. Um, and share it with your um, leadership team and your staff. Um, in addition to the FY22-23 data, also we, we added under the, there's a little box that says Maine's Model School Support, and that's where we put in all the tier three allocations. So all the funding that tier three identified schools received for SIG money for FY24, we put that also in there along with the the strategies and interventions that are being used with the SIG money that were identified in the FY24 application. So that is there. Um, in addition, there's also an all call for presenters for the 2024 Maine Department of Education, the annual summit. It's August 6th through the 8th. And, um, and I will put the link in the chat so you guys can look at that too, if I have it here. There we go. So that's the that's the chat there. Um, the, we also uh, we did a collaboration with the assessment team. So working with Jess and Rita from Title One, and myself, Krista Averill created a guide for SAUs for how they can populate their comprehensive needs assessment, or sometimes we call it the Title One school wide plan. If um, by accessing the student score data file that's in the Map Growth platform and so you can go to that and help you populate some of the information that you need for your CNA. And the MDOE is also working 
We're always on working on ways to try to help SAUs and schools access their data um, and that they can just pile or kind of populate or put that into their CNA without too much trouble. And I will put that link in the chat as well. So in the chat right now is the link to the main educators of summit, uh, the all call for presenters, and then also the document that Krista Averill worked to try to help schools use their um, NWA data or main three years three year assessment to populate some of their CNA data that's um, in the CNA. Um, there is no update on Maine's model of school support identification timeline for right now. We were hoping it was going to be sometime in March, but we're not really sure where that's going to be at this point. So there's that's still uh, to be determined. Um, we're still calculating the data and we're still waiting for to hear back from the Department of Education regarding the amendment. Um, and then there's no update. I know Cheryl Lang was the coordinator. Um, she did retire in January. So we don't have an update on that position. And then I just wanted to, I threw this in here last minute because um, the FY23 SIG funds, they are, that period of availability is running out on 930. That has a tidings waiver. So there will be no more extensions for this funding. And we ran a quick report. And at this point, only 38% of that money has been invoiced or drawn down. So we're really encouraging schools that if you have obligated those funds, those FY23 SIG funds, um, get those invoicing, that invoices in. If you can work with your business manager, try to get those invoices in. If you haven't obligated those funds or haven't started doing the things you said you were gonna do, start doing them, get those funds obligated because there's not that much time left uh, between now and 9.30. And some of this may change too. If you are a school that has the potential to exit when we do make the identifications, that will give you probably less time also to obligate and um, and invoice for those funds. So just kind of a heads up, um, not anything to com be completely worried about, but we don't want to wait until like uh, June and say, oh, you've got to spend this money. So just kind of a heads up there. Okay, so before I get on to the next slides, which would be about the grant requirements, I wanted to stress that the reason why I'm bringing these into these meetings, uh, kind of about the grant requirements, because I've heard frustration from our principals and from some of the coaches uh, that are um, communicating what some of the principals are feeling, that some of the applications are getting sent back um, as not approved or needing more detail. And some of that reason is because of the grant. Last time, last meeting was more about um, just the requirements that the SIG application requires based on statute. And today's more of just general grant requirements um, or specific to SIG. So just to kind of give principals a little bit of heads up about that, because some of you guys wear two hats. Some of you are ESEA coordinators and some of you aren't. So this grant, federal grant world can be a little um, confusing or you may not understand it. So to start off first, I just wanted to do some just general grant uh, terms uh, to give you a kind of an idea of just generally how grant funds work within federal funds. So there's reasonable, necessary, allowable, allocable, documented, and neutral. And these are the terms you're gonna hear a lot with federal funds. So regardless of what federal fund we're talking about. Neutral doesn't really apply much to SIG money, but I wanted to throw it in there. And that is that all your all costs have to be secular and not ideological in nature. And then documented, everything has to be documented. Sometimes we ask for that documentation in the application. And sometimes we're like, just hold on to it, keep it at your school site or your SAU site. Um, and we may ask for it later. And then to reasonable and necessary, a lot of times those go, those go hand in hand. Uh, reasonable that it's not excessive and based on prudent purchasing and then necessary essential for carrying out resulting programs and services to meet student needs. A lot of times those two go together because something may not seem reasonable, but if you can show them the, ne the, the necessity of it, it can change it to become reasonable. Um, and this is kind of a far out example, but if you want to send your entire staff to Hawaii for a conference, that doesn't really seem, that might not seem reasonable. Uh, maybe you could send your staff to a conference in Boston 
or maybe you could send half your staff to a, a conference in Boston and then do a training the trainer model. So sometimes when I provide feedback back, <laughs> I'll feedback, I'll say, hey, can you explain how this is a reasonable and necessary to be able to uh, carry out the programming you need in your plan? So like you have to do this because if you don't, you won't be able to carry through with your action step. You have to send your teachers to this training so that you can carry through with your action step and therefore be able to continue on with your plan or implement your strategic plan. Allowable, those costs must be allowable for, for this one is for, for specific school improvement grant funds, which I'm gonna talk about on the next slide. And then allocable, um, this one's always a little more confusing. Um, you think allocable, allocable and allo allowable sometimes are the same, but allocable really is about if you have multiple funding sources and you have a person that's being like funded with multiple ones, you want to make sure that that the part that's being used for SIG funds is dedicated to SIG activities that are approved in the application. And the reason why I bring this up is because I just recently had a school that um, told me that they had a consultant, outside consultant that they were working with, but this outside consultant was doing work in the district as a whole. And I said, well, you want to make sure that the part that you're using SIG money for is just with SIG activities or approved activities that were in the application. So that's where the allocable comes in. And then, of course, there's the documentation. Again, um, you want to make sure that you're documenting this as well. Sometimes, again, we, we ask for it to be put in the application. And sometimes we'll just say, hold on to it in case you get audited or we request it. So again, these are <clears throat> very common terms in federal programming um, and with federal funds. Okay. So the next one um, really talks more about allowability and the grant award notification actually to kind of puts in there what the terms and conditions are for this grant. And for some of you, this is this is you know very um, you know what this is about. But for the others of you that have never seen a grant award notification, I thought I would throw this in there. And again, so I put this in there because um, sometimes people aren't really clear about why things get sent back and where the basis of it is. So I'm trying to provide that background for you for those of you who need it. Um, so in the grant award notification, it says these. These program improvement funds are intended to be used for the organization and active functioning of a leadership team, approved leadership team meetings, and a professional learning opportunities for staff members. And we have a bunch of examples that are listed as well. Um, so that's where that connection is. So sometimes when I provide feedback, I'm like, hey, can you connect this back to the allowable uses uh, for school improvement funds? And yeah, okay. And then again, this is just another piece to the grant award notification. It talks about when the obligation is, when you have to invoice by, um, and then, uh, you know, just being a subrecipient, then if we ask for any kind of documentation, um, you need to have it and be able to submit to us. And then, you know, any failure to comply with the terms could result in, um, you know, loss of the, of the funds or having to return them. And, I think that we just talked about that at a meeting I had earlier today. Our ultimate goal for everyone is that we don't want any school or district have to return funds. So sometimes, sometimes when it feels like we're being really nitpicky or like why they keep asking me these questions, because we don't want anyone to have to return funds. That is, that's something we want to avoid. And then the last slide is just, I know if you're like me, you want to know where this is located. So if you go to your sections, um, the sections part of your application, down at the bottom, I know this is really tiny, I was trying to get it on one screen. If you go down to the bottom of the section section, it'll say grant award notification. And then if you click on that, it'll tell you all the pieces of that grant, the, the period of allowability, how much, um, and then the terms and conditions. And there's also another section, which I'm not gonna highlight, but it also has uh, more resources for things like, we get a lot of questions about, can I use this money for food? And so there's very clear, a very clear, um, like direct or regulations about how food can be used, but I didn't want to spend time on that today. So I'm skipping that slide. I know that's a lot, but again, I'm just trying to give everybody a background 
of why things might get sent back if there's, is this necessary? Is this reasonable? Is it allowable? Okay. So outside and external consultants, I did mention this at the last in the January meeting uh, because it was a lot of a lot of questions were coming up, a lot of uh, clarifications were needed for uh, for our schools. So I just want to bring it up again um, that you know you want to make sure that you have a rigorous review process. Uh, we're not going to tell you what that looks like, but it should align with your SAU procurement policies and or the uniform grant guidance, which is 2 CFR 200.320. Um, and you're gonna to wanna to use whichever policy is more stringent. Now, I know many of you, almost all of you are principals and that's the hat you wear. So the first thing I would say is go to your superintendent or go to your uh, your business manager. The SAU is the fiscal agent for, this, for the SIG money. So they will be able to help you with that. Uh, but I do wanna tell you that I did have a school reach out to me and ask me for some assistance. And I went onto their district website. I went to their local board policies. And there in their local board policies, they had several procurement policies. One was specific to federal funds. And it was almost verbatim what was in 2 CFR 200-320. So um, most schools, I think all school districts have these policies. Um, as a principal, you may not know them because it's not really in your, not really what you do all the time, but reach out to your superintendent or an and or business manager, whichever person. Uh, has been designated for that. And then we are asking for contracts to be uploaded um, to the application because there we can see to make sure that the costs are reasonable and necessary, that they align to the plan um, and that they are meeting um, the uniform grant guidance. So again, none of this is meant to stress people out. It's just to give them a background knowledge. So if questions come or some feedback comes, you have a better background knowledge of why. And the same goes with professional learning. Um, this is an area that was kind of pointed out to us um, at the audit, the federal audit we had back in May, last May. Um, you just wanna make sure that you maintain your documentation that for the rationale for your conferences, especially if they're the one day or two day, um, and that the data connects back to your uh, plan, um, your SMART goals, and that you can really put that tie there. Because I know a lot of things come up in the middle of the year, and a lot of people will, come, will reopen their applications to make changes um, or make updates. You just want to make sure that everything goes back to uh, to your plan, and that it's not just a one day, and that it just it kind of beats into that whole into your whole uh, perspective of your plan. So I think that's it for requirements. Check my notes real quickly here. And we will have time at the um, at the end for questions. Plenty of time for that. Okay. So again, moving on to the year at a glance, we've been trying to do this at every meeting uh, this year. Uh, the year at a glance is just a kind of a guide for uh, school leadership teams to think about where they should be in their school improvement process. And in February, it's mid-year report outs and celebrations. Now I know we have one day left in February. So you may have already done this, or you may be thinking about doing it in March. So uh, this is just kind of could be a review for some of you. It could be something as kind of like just a, uh, a reinforcement of what you're already doing. Right, just getting caught up with my notes. So at the December meeting back, um, at, yeah, the December meeting, we presented uh, a template for a leadership team uh, leadership teams to use as a, their agenda template to make sure that they're using they're talking about the pieces that we know the evidence based practice has shown is effective for school improvement. Um, but now we're mid year and kind of looking at our plan. So I just put some questions up here with your leadership team, looking at your strategic plan. And again, I think I mentioned um, back in December, this is also gonna be for your FY23 plan as, as well. Um, what are continuous school improvement journey successes? What progress has been made towards meeting the, the strategic plan goals and accomplishing outcomes long-term and short-term? And then what is the status of your strategies and action steps, the implementation, the effectiveness of it? <clears throat> 
because I know we're almost in March, March is tomorrow, but you don't really want to wait until May or even June or July to determine if what your, your action steps were successful. You want to monitor them along the way so you can make, you know, corrections or you can make adjustments or um, you can realize, oh my gosh, we haven't even started this yet. Um, so you can, you know, keep track of that as you're going. Again, some of you may already be doing this and that's awesome. It's just more of like a, a reinforcement of continuing looking at your strategic plan. And it's not just something that you do in October um, on the due date and then don't look at it again until you know May or June. I know none of you are doing that, but um, just a continuous uh, review of the plan. And then I just wanted to pull out um, one example um, and I know that there's a lot of different activities that are being done with SIG funds, but I think the majority of it is professional learning because that's really what we wanted these funds to be used for, to be sustainable, to build capacity of our uh, the staff in the schools. Um, and that really is what we're trying to use with SIG funds, is to build capacity of the leadership teams, to build capacity of the staff in the schools, to build sustainability, so when these funds are no longer available, that the continuous schooling process can continue. So thinking about your professional learning that has already happened, um, say you've sent some of your staff to do some responsive classroom training, thinking about that training, uh, what skills and strategies have been learned from that training, uh, the professional learning, and the skills that have been learned, are they the identified ones that were in the strategic plan? Um, to what degree have these skills and strategies been implemented or used thus far? So we went to this training back in November. Have we done anything with it? Um, and then is it being measured? Uh, how's the implementation of these skills and strategies being measured, aligned to the strategic plan goals? And has the instructional practice changed due to the training or professional learning? How? And then what data supports that response? Um, I do have a few more slides, but I'm not going to show them. Um, but, you know, but the, this could be the same with the book study, um, with uh, a consultant. A lot of schools are using consultants. Um, is the, the work that the consultant, um, you know, said they were going to do, is that having any impact? Um, is it addressing the, the identified needs? Um, so kind of looking at that. You don't want to wait till the end of the school year to determine if the consultant's work was impactful or effective or helped align, align back to your strategic plan. And then next steps. Now, once you look at your action steps you know, as a whole, you know, is the strategic plan effective? What's working? What's not working? Um, can the plan move forward because progress is being made? Does the plan need to be updated? Do action step strategies need to be adjusted? Um, do SMART goals need to be updated? And then once you answer all those questions or think about those questions, what data supports the responses to these questions? So you may be able to say, yeah, it's working, but what's the data to show that it's working? So these are all questions to think about, um, you know, mid-year. Now I know we have more, we have more months behind, you know, behind us than we have ahead of us. So it's probably a little bit more than halfway through the year, uh, but there's a lot of questions to think about on the effectiveness of your plan. And then lastly, I just wanted to say that it was very timely. I had a conversation with a principal yesterday and she was talking about revising her FY23 SIG application. And I said, do you mind if I quote you? Now I paraphrased it just a little bit but I just thought it was really, it just really connected well with what today's um, kind of content was going to be. And she said, we decided to revise our FY23 SIG application because our action steps didn't really align with our goals. And we aren't doing what our plan said. With the updates, our action steps are more aligned with our strategic plan goals. And there is also more alignment with our MTSS work. So I was like, that's exactly what we want to do with this work. It is ongoing. It is continuous school improvement. Um, and it's not a static plan. So I said, I'm going to quote you. <laughs> and I'm going to use what you said in our presentation. So thank you to her. And so that's pretty much 
kind of the bulk of this presentation. Um, I tried to make it quick because I know you guys have a lot on your plate uh, and just things to think about this time of the year with your leadership team and also with your staff. And I just want to talk about just real briefly next month. Um, so if you go back to the year at a glance, March is to revisit and update the CNA and root cause analysis. So for next month, I want to really focus on revisiting the comprehensive needs assessment. I say the Title I school-wide plan because they are pretty much the same for Tier 3 schools because um, you operate a Title I school-wide plan, or operate a Title I school-wide, um, you operate a Title I school-wide program. And so rather than have two separate plans, they're just one plan together, the comprehensive needs assessment. And then really trying to make those connections with other um, initiatives and programming that's happening in your school. Um, you have another ESCA consolidated app that your district has. You have other grants that are happening. There's a literacy grant, just to name one. Um, you have a, other programming, MTSS, PIBIS, BAR. I'm sure I could list a whole bunch more, but really trying to help make that those connections and interconnections with that the SIG is not just one more thing, that it's connected with everything else that you're doing in your school. Um, and so that there's a lot of crossover. So that's my hope that we can explore that uh, more next month. And that is it. There's the professional learning. I can put that in the chat. If you guys don't have that link, let me put that in there. These are all of the trainings that are happening at the department. And then just resources, again, um, I put assessment in there and higher ed. So if you want to go back or lose the link from the chat, you can find that assessment, collabor the collaboration document that we did with Krista. And then our contact information. And then I'm going to mention this. I'm going to go and then I'm going to go to that slide so you can or go to that uh, jam board. So we really want that's why I'm giving some time now at the end, because we want to get your input on support being provided for schools identified for tier three supports or CSI. Um, we want you to take a few minutes to complete the questions. There's only two and I'll show that in a second. I'll put the link in the chat um, and then another survey hopefully will going out. I'm hoping in March, um, where it'll ask a little bit more progress on your strategic plan and maybe a little more detail about the supports um, that are working and are not working. And then at the same time, while you're doing that, we are going to have time for questions or any thoughts that you have. So you can work on the uh, on the Jamboard, the two questions, which I'll go over in a second. And then you can also feel free to unmute yourself or use the chat to ask questions.